I couldn't remember if it's cafe con pam or pam con cafe. Con cafe. <laughs> you know, some people mix those up, but you know, it works. I love it. Sabrosura pa ti que Hola manis, welcome to Café con Pam, the place where we share our stories over some cafecito, but I'm drinking tea today. <laughs> Yo soy Pam and we bring you inspiring stories from first generation Latinas and people of the global majority. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, ring the bell, so you never miss our cafecito time. And of course, if you want to hear more incredible stories, you can tune into the podcast as well. Today's episode is brought to you by No Mono. This is the traveling sound capsule que nos acompaña durante nuestro in-person tour. Today's conversation is with a dear friend of mine, Lauren Marie Fleming. Lauren is the author of the queer contemporary romance novel, Because Fat Girl, and the author of the nonfiction self-help book, Body Love, 10 Steps to Profoundly Loving Your Body. She's also the founder of SchoolForWriters.com. Lauren is dedicated to helping diverse storytellers thrive, including supporting aspiring authors in writing and publishing their books and helping established professionals in making more time for creativity in their lives. During her 20-year writing career, Lauren has been featured in prominent media outlets, including Good Morning America, Glamour, XO Jane, Autostraddle, and Cosmo, and has had columns for Curve Magazine, Vice Magazine, and the Huffington Post. Lauren is a highly sought after and entertaining public speaker and has spoken at prestigious conferences and colleges, including Yale, Brown, Wordstock, BinderCon, and Blocker. Always up for an adventure, Lauren has lived all over the world and will try anything once as long as it's gluten free <laughs> when not traveling. Lauren can be found walking her dog on the beach in San Diego listening to a good audiobook. Este episodio is very special because, of course, Lauren is a good friend of mine and I have seen a lot of behind the scenes and I have a lot of context from her novel coming out, from her book coming out. And this is one of the few episodes where a guest makes me cry. And I think you'll see. <laughs> I think it's because I I have a lot more context. So when she shares, when Lauren shares that part of the story where I start tearing up is because I have heard the story in other times at with more detail and my brain just kind of like went to those moments. So I hope maybe you won't be as moved, but I wanted to give you context as to why I got teared up because I, I, kind of have seen lots of behind the scenes of of this journey and I'm so excited and so happy to present to you this conversation with my dear friend Lauren Marie Fleming. Cheers my friend. Cheers. Congratulations. It's like te con pam right now. Te con pam. <laughs> te con pam. <laughs> So Lauren, congrats. I am so excited. I have been a listener and a fan of yours for so long. Oh my it's gosh. Such an honor to be the on. feeling's mutual. And I can't I'm so like where's my book? So we have we've copies. We got the book. We got the book. So this book is a long time in the making. Yeah. Tell me all about it. How long did it take? So this particular book has been seven years in the making from when I started it to when it came out. But my publishing journey with fiction. I started my first fiction book. I just realized this. Um, I started 20 years ago this month. Wow. It will be almost to the week from when I started my first fiction book to when it came out. Okay. And that, in that time, I have been actively writing and actively trying to get published. And in that time, life has been a roller coaster. And in that time, we have gone from queer books are on these specialty presses just for gay people yeah. to I'm still dealing with a lot of homophobia when I tried to publish this book but I finally found a publisher who was like yes we are dedicated to diversity we're dedicated to books we are going to not only buy this book but we are going to put marketing behind it which is the thing right they'll buy them mm. and then they don't succeed mm -hmm. and then suddenly nobody wants a book like that oh you know diverse books don't sell well yeah you gave it no marketing you didn't like open the market to it your team half-assed it. They thought that it would be enough to just like have bought it and not do something behind it. It's like every DEI initiative mm -hmm. in, <laughs> that happened in that 2020 didn't that didn't work is similar. They don't give it time to work, right? Most books take five years to even find their audience. 
and they don't give that to people like to various different marginalized communities and historically silenced and underrepresented. So it was 20 years of rejection saying no one's going to buy a lesbian book. 20 years of rejection being like, we'll take this book if, if there's diet talk in it, but not if it's no a body positive way. that happened to my body love nonfiction book, which I eventually self published because I couldn't find a publisher who would let me publish it without talking about weight loss. Oh my in God. a book about loving your body. What? A book called Body Love, 10 Steps to Profoundly Loving Your Body. They were like, we're going to need a diet section because being, a, being overweight is unhealthy and we're promoting obesity if not, right? I got told on this book, switch the genders and I can sell it tomorrow. No. Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. So like 20 years of that. And so I say that over and over again because I think we are in the world where people see overnight successes because somebody from TikTok happened to hit a thing, they hit a thing and they got a seven figure book deal and now they're the biggest deal in the world and I am behind the scenes with those people and they're struggling to get taken seriously still. So I like to be honest about it, not as like a woe is me, although woe is me, that sucked, but also like for those out there that are facing the rejection and they're like, is it something about me? Yes, go get better at your craft. I think everybody can get better at their craft and also it's not you, it's like, the, the industry it's, it's the industry it's every industry well and every industry hasn't been like getting with the program until they do so it took 20 years to write this book it took 20 years to get published seven years to write to get published it took about a year to write it and then like six years to edit it <laughs> Mm. And that's a thing, right? So tell me how the characters started and how they grew and evolved as your life also changed. Yeah. So um, I always say that this book started as a, I had a dream that The Rock wanted to date me, like <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And I turned him down because at the time he was in the news for like saying all these great feminist stuff about different bodies and different shapes and different everything. And I was like, except I cannot be the fat lesbian dating The Rock. <laughs> like That doesn't... Okay. That's not good for me in the news. Like you get to be the amazing, wonderful feminist that's open to everybody. And then I'm the like fat lesbian made fun of. Oops, sorry, hit my mic. Um, and that doesn't work well for me. And then in the dream, he was like, but we're in love. And I was like, what does love have to do with this? I am tr I'm on my career path. That There's was a no story. time for love. And I woke up from that dream and I was like, that is a great premise for a book. Mm. And I was in Mexico City at the time. And I was working on a book about grief that was like a deep, serious profound literary book that was gonna finally get me taken sick seriously in the world and every time I went to write it I just wanted to write about how the rock wanted to date me <laughs> and I was like well don't write about that like write about grief and then I just kept wanting I kept having the dream over and over and over again and then there was it was in September and it was the 30 year anniversary of the massive earthquake that yeah. Mexico City had and on the anniversary to the hour there was another massive earthquake. And I was sitting there watching the world fall down around me. And I was like, I don't wanna write about grief. I'm too sad. Everything is sad right now. Right. My brother just died. I could have died. People around me are dying. Like I was in, I was there like raising funds for people who had lost their houses. And I was like, I just, like, I was like, we have to write about the hard things in life. I was like, I just wanna write about the rock wine to date me. Like I need to write about joy. Mm. And in a romance, in a Hollywood setting, in that Cinderella, in the glitz and glam of fashion, I'm actually able to write about the deeper stuff better yeah. in a way that our nervous systems can handle, Yes. in the way my nervous system can handle. So this is a book about your life, your the rug being pulled out under you when grief hits. And what do you do then? It's a book about feeling worthy of love. It's a book about all the things I want to write about in my serious, profound literary world set in the glitz and glam of Hollywood so I could personally handle it amidst some serious trauma that I was experiencing. So many layers. So many layers. <laughs> <laughs> so when you get this dream and all you want to write is, you know, the rock. I mean, who doesn't want to write that one of the hottest guys in the world wants to date you? Like, I, I needed that self-esteem boost at the time. <laughs> totally, totally. And so, how, well, let's backtrack even a little further. Because you grew up in El Centro, in, in like... Well, Farmland, so California. I grew, up, I grew up in Brawley. Brawley, let's and be specific. And El Centro is our, our rival little town ah! because they've had a rivalry for like a hundred years since the town was even there. Um, and we like had a 
football game. So is it the Imperial Valley? Imperial Valley. Okay. So I grew up, my parents' house is like 20 miles from the Mexican border. My town is like 90% Mexican, mostly first generation. So I grew up surrounded by Mexican culture. And even because there's influences, there's a lot of influences and it's a hard line. It's something I always try to talk openly about. Like it's a really hard line for me because I do not want to appropriate a culture and I do not want to uh, recognize that like I was still a farmer in a town of farm workers, right? Like I was still a gringa and that came with so much fucking privilege. And I grew up with mariachi around me eating rebanaditas <laughs> like and churros with the limon from the like Gabolita on the corner, right? Like I grew up completely surrounded by Mexican culture. Yeah. And so it matters to me to honor that part of my life too. Um, and it is, it is very much in this book to the point that people are like, is she like, I'm like, she lives in Southern California. You should be wondering, like right. she should be like, why don't you all speak Spanish? Why is Mexico not more a part of your culture? Like that's, that's important. So for me, that upbringing was also a part of like a conservative farming town too, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that has a bit in this book. Uh, we had to take out some of that because it was just getting too long. I'm a very wordy person. As you can tell, I talk a lot, um, <laughs> as you know very well as my friend. But, um, but that influenced so much of who I was. For sure. And I also think like, it was a tiny rural town with very little access to resources, but the resources we had were often put like into sports, but there was this core group of people who were very dedicated to culture. So like we had a mariachi festival. I learned how to dance like the hat dance and everything as a kid with the like big dresses. Yeah. We knew like we had a theater company that did stuff even in our like shitty place where the mics didn't work. We had to like yell when it would break and the like lights would fall and like it was all this stuff, but we would do it. And so I grew up knowing that the arts were important and that is a rarity in yeah. a small town to get that. I mean, we did not get the funding of the football team. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> we had no funding, but we still did it. And it was really beautiful to be surrounded by that kind of art. And that includes so much of like the Mexican culture and art and sound and music and For like, sure. performances. Totally. So you grew up in this little border town. And how does little Lauren believe that she can write a book one day? Because there's so many people yeah. that would look be like, oh, well, but Lauren could because it's, you know, but let's bring, I always like to bring that context because I feel like you spoke on that overnight success that it's like, oh yeah, all of a sudden, like here you are. And, but really I think the substance and what makes people is those like little nuances and that context actually, to me, context brings roots back mm -hmm. to the story. And it could help also as you read the book and see the references, you could, instead of questioning it, like, where'd she get that from? Mm -hmm. Like, I got text from you <laughs> as you were writing this. Like, <laughs> you know, should I say this or uh -huh. should I say this? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for people as they read it, as they read the book, to have that context of you so that when they get, their brain gets to, like, how dare she talk about that? Like, what does mm -hmm. she know? They know that you know. Mm -hmm. So it's funny because the thing that I've sent you texts about, like the, there's a phrase, there's a couple different phrases and every, like the people I, I grew up with Spanglish and I grew up with a very, like the people that spoke Spanish around me never had any formal training. They never learned Spanish. And so the way we said things was like, so not right. I remember going to Mexico city and then like everybody laughing at me at how bad my Spanish was. They're like, you sound like a hick from the sticks. And I'm like, I am a hick from the sticks. That is why. <laughs> And so I would ask my friends, like, hey, how do you say this? So I'd ask you. And then I have a really great friend named Neek Day who recently passed away. And I'm just, like, devastated she didn't make it to my book launch because she was the biggest advocate for this book. And she had cancer. And I tried to give her an early copy. And she said, I'm going to get one at your book launch. And she died a few months ago. And it just, like, breaks my heart. But I would ask her if she lives in Tijuana. Completely different answer than you, who was from Mexico City. Completely different answer from anybody from my hometown. Yes. So it was like trying to make sure that it was like actually a grounded, like anytime I used any references to anything Mexi uh, from about Mexico or about Spanish. Um, you asked about the little moments. I think that I didn't become a writer because 
anybody ever told me I could be a writer. Mm. I was highly discouraged from any career in the arts. Like, it was the kind of thing that's cute that you do on the side. Well, you come from a family of practical people. I, I come mean, from farmers, farmers. are practical. Which is so interesting to me because my grandpa was a very prolific painter. He painted all the time, up until he died. Like, and my grandpa and I would paint together. And the paintings are in your house. The paintings are in my house, yes. right? And, and they were patrons of the arts. They, they had multiple artists on both sides of the border that they supported and bought art from and helped like raise money for. They were huge patrons of the arts. And it was like, it's the kind of thing you do when you're 65 and you retire mm. after working a serious professional real job the rest of your life, right? It's the kind of thing you do on vacation when you've earned your vacation. It's not the thing you do for a living. For sure. So he painted, but he wasn't a painter. I think he was a painter by like 20 years in, by like age 85, right? Or like wow. however old he retired, right? It was like 20 years. Post retirement. Until, yeah, it was all post retirement. Yeah. I know, my grandpa lived to 93 and he and I were painting like up until a week before he died together. I probably kept, I mean, I don't know. Alive. No, for sure. I look at like that, the next generation, they don't have hobbies and they're all like wasting away and in a different way than my grandpa who would lived a vibrant life. And I fully believe it's because of his love of art. <gasps> so yeah. is he an influence on he's your writing? He's a massive influence. Yeah, he's an influence on, he's an influence on my ability to know that art deserves space in my life. Mm. Yeah. I love that. And that's something I wish everybody got. Totally. You know? Totally. I agree. 100%. Yeah. And so I think for me writing, you now it was this fat, awkward, queer kid who now I know was very neurodiverse, but also had major depression as a kid. And writing started with me like I'd be bullied at school and I'd come home and I'd write dialogue of what I could say if I had just like, oh, if I had just had the right comeback and I'd have whole dialogues where like, I got them. Or this person I had a crush on, like we had a conversation instead of me like hiding in the corner, right? Or anytime I was mad at my parents and I couldn't talk to them, I would like write it all out. So it, it became, I started writing dialogue because I needed to, I had things I needed to say that I couldn't say. Mm. Or I had like, I had to protect myself when others wouldn't stand up for me. And I could do that on the pages of my journal. So if I go back and look at those, oh my God, I was such an angsty teen. But like also I was dealing with, you know, what do you say to the kid who calls you Shamu every day before English to the point that you're like in therapy cutting yourself? Like I was a self-harmer and it was really intense. And writing became my way to put it, take it out, not on myself. Totally. Yeah. I mean, writing is really about journaling. You journaling. edit over journaling a lot. Your journaling. They show that even 15 minutes a day of journaling is as beneficial like i'm not anti-medicine but it's as beneficial as medicine as uh depressive medicines and there's studies mm -hmm. so like, many studies that show the power of your brain to your hand to the paper mm -hmm. to the ink to like I'll tell you the amount of things that have come true since i wrote this book that i wrote in this book is like manifestation 101 it's shocking i'm like Whatever is, people could be asking me what book's next. I'm like, well, I have like 13 books that I've written that publishers didn't want to take that I could maybe do now, but I kind of want to be like, Lauren gets super rich and super famous and all of her friends also get rich and famous. Like, I'm like, how can I manifest? <laughs> how can I make this happen? Keep journaling. Right? Keep writing it. So let's talk about the word fat, because I mm -hmm. saw you recently talk about it. And even I use it and there's this, so, I believe words are spells, words have power, mm -hmm. and also we give power to the words. And so when I've talked about, yeah, my friend wrote a book that's called Because Fat Girl, you get this like, mm -mm. I even feel could like you say like that again? Like maybe she like big, overweight, you know? And I'm like, no, fat. <laughs> because what power are you giving to the word as you're saying it. Have you, what I, you wrote about it, that people are, have given you backlash. What would you say to those that say, I don't wanna talk about it because I don't wanna say the word fat? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I've had so many interesting things, it, reactions to this. My two favorites so far is, 
I had I was very lucky the San Diego Union Tribune sent a photographer to my house to do a piece on me. It was great. And the photographer was afraid of photographing me with my book because he was afraid the word fat would be too offensive. Wow. Uh -huh. I'm like, but like, he's like, but we, it's too offensive. Like he was very nervous about it. They ended up using the book. Yay. They ended up using the photo. Um, as it's a great should. photo, as they should. And then my second story is I went to San Francisco before I'm doing a big book launch party there. And I went to the bookstore. And they, I said, hi, I'm Lauren Marie Fleming. I'm doing an event here in a bit. They're like, oh yeah, we have your poster. And the manager started teary eyed telling me, this is Books Inc and Laurel Village in San Francisco, shout out to them, um, that a kid came in recently and said, mom, that book says fat on it. It says fat girl. And was like, oh my God, there's a bad word on there. And the mom was flustered and didn't know how to respond and was like struggling to respond to their kid about the word fat and what it was like and everything. And the manager, who she self-identified as a fat person, she told me that she's had a conversation with this kid about, isn't that cool? Have you ever seen a book with the word fat on it that's not shaming somebody? Have yes. you ever seen a book that's like talks about this? Have you ever seen a book that's like that? And like short, tall, thin, it's all a, a, like, it's all the power we give it. Have you ever seen this? And the kid's like, oh, that's really cool. And the mom was like, thank you. And I just think about those moments where mm. e whatever happens with this book, there's going to be a book out in the world that helps neutralize the word fat. And whatever you want about weight and your body and health and all the, all the just massive amount of weight, literally and figuratively, we put on the word fat. The fact is it's literally just an additive. Mm -hmm. It is not any more valuable than thin. It is not any more valuable right. than tall or short. It is just simply a word. And if we can let go of the bullshit we have around the word, we can get to the other things that we are as humans. And maybe that does mean that you're going to make a choice to do A or B, but what it really means is like, what if, no matter what your size, you just accept yourself as you are right now and you love yourself as you are right now. Like I spent so much time trying to lose weight as a kid forced on diets and all the time I could spend instead now of like focusing on everything else in my life is just so much better than hating myself. Mm. And for me, because fat girl, I explain in the book, it's, it's a saying from the body positive community that is, is kind of like tongue in cheek. Why do I love fries with cheese so much? Because fat girl, <laughs> you know, it's cute when my sister eats a whole box of fries with cheese. It's uh, not okay if I eat a handful, right? Like there's that thing. Like, why is my sister who can eat twice as much as me is a tiny human. I don't know where she puts it. She will sit down and eat two steaks and it's cute, but I'm on a diet my whole life, right? because of my metabolism, because of my size, because of whatever, because fat girl. But it's also like, I can be funny about it. Oh yeah, you know, I love, I got me two desserts today because fat girl, right? Mm. Or I can be like, why did the doctor not take me seriously when I had fibroids for years and she never told me and she said, you should just lose weight and never told me. She knew that I had this thing that was getting worse and worse and worse until I had to have it, my uterus removed because fat girl. So it's yeah. like the comedy and the reality and the tragedy of the way that we're treated completely differently mm. based on our size. Mm. Right? So it's good. And it's all just right front and cover. I was like, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it well, and we're going to make that the boldest word on that. And it is such a great cover. It's one of the best covers I've seen. Is there a reason you didn't put yourself in the cover? Um, well, one, you rarely ever put yourself in the cover. I don't know of a fiction. I don't know a single fiction that has on the cover. Um, Two, they, d they went through like 20 different covers and they sent me a pretty close version of this. So I didn't have the most, I just could give like notes. Um, and two, it's so funny. I actually ended up loving this because my friend Jen Leva, it looks just like her. It looks just like her. And she's been one of my biggest influences in accepting the term fat for myself. So it felt really great to yeah. have her on the cover. And her mom looked at it. She's like, that looks like you. And it looks just like her. And she's just such a wonderful person and has helped me like love myself. And she might've even been one of the first people to introduce me to the term because fat girl. So it felt so pro like when they showed me that, cause there were a couple of different versions of the photos like that one. That looks like my friend Jen. I love it. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I noticed is the disclaimer where you yes. talk about um, all of the like harder topics to, to talk about. 
past sexual assault, disordered eating, grief, death by cancer, mental health struggles. <laughs> <laughs> I, I laughed so much. I laughed so hard at that. That was actually the editorial team. They did that. They're like, what do you think? I was like, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> laughed so much about that. Suicidal ideation, past self harm. Tell me more about that. Is it like a trigger warning? Yeah. So this is something that I think Entangled does really well, my publisher, and they recognize that when you pick up a contemporary romance you're used to lots of just like fluffy stuff which is why people love romance and i don't i know that that term fluffy can be used negatively and i mean that in the greatest way after my brother died when everything was heavy in my life i needed let's reason fluffy let's just do a book that all i have to worry about is are they going to end up together and i know they are because it's a romance right, right? <laughs> but I i'm a multi-dimensional human who has you know a lot of this stuff is me and my friends and so when I went to write a book, you know, I get asked by a lot of people, how did you decide to make this book diverse? And I was like, that's hilarious because I would have had to decide to make it not. Wow. <laughs> right? Like yes. it, it would have had to be erasing, like the friends are based off my friends. The people are based off my people. I didn't like go in and be like, here's a list of the different marginalized communities that I want to feature. No, I was just like, here's the friends that I think would be fun to like talk about in this book that are characters. And so, taking those two things together, like the expectation of a romance reader, which is often to not be triggered, and my need to be a multidimensional human who has a shit ton of trauma in her life, and all of that stuff I've dealt with, um, how do we put that together so we can support the nervous systems of the readers while also allowing those who need to read about stuff that, you know, this is still a fluffy, fun book with an amazing happily ever after that is going to make you cry all the good tears. But it deals with the hard stuff. And to do that, you needed to have a, a, a content warning. I love that. Yeah. So I have a question from a listener. I love this. So Angela. Hi, Angela. Angela found out about your book because I, I mentioned it somewhere. I don't remember. So Angela has the gay podca podcast for everyone. I love that title. It's, it's the gay podcast for everyone. The gay podcast for everyone. Love it. I know. And so... The question is, shout out to Angela. I'm curious about outside of the discipline of writing and the habit of it, what or who are the things that keep her showing up, especially when things got hard? I love that. Um, except I don't like the first part because I have no discipline and I have no habit. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I have no discipline and I have no habit. And for so long, I beat myself up because I didn't have the discipline and I didn't have the habit. And I realized that that was still from, that was from diet culture. And that was from hustle culture. That was from capitalism. Um, the patriarchy. The patri like there's so much shit around that word. humans. Um, and routine might work for some people, but it's never worked for me and my ADHD brain. It's never worked for me in my depressive episodes. Um, and then you feel shitty. So I try to think about ritual instead. Mm. Like what, and to me a ritual, like rituals have existed for millennia and they connect you to source, to something bigger than you, to God, to your like gods, uh, to the earth, to whatever. So for me, I'm like, how can, like, what is my connection and how do I connect? Um, so nature is a lot of it. Tea is a lot of it. Um, I had to give myself a coffee shop budget because I wrote I in that. coffee shops. Yes. But I wouldn't write in my house because in my house, if I went to go write my, if you ever come into my house and it is super clean, you know I'm on deadline. <laughs> and if you come into my house and it's a mess, you know I've been writing. <laughs> Mm. Right, because like if I need to clean, yeah. I'm gonna be writing, and if I need to write, I'm gonna clean. Um, ADHD tip there, you're welcome. Yes. That's the most productive hack I have. <laughs> yes. um, is productive procrastination. And so for me, there's a couple things. One, it's like how do you take time out to go for a walk? When you, how do you take time out to go to the grocery store and make food that's gonna actually like feel good? I have lots of food allergies, so like how do you eat food that? To me, it is another form of survival. Mm. It's another form of connecting to something bigger than myself. It's another form of relaxing and self-care. So the only way I know how to keep doing it, even when life is distracting, even when everything, is one, I have to think of my legacy. If I thought about just what I'm doing right now, 20 years, I would have given up a long time ago. There was a lot of rejection in those 20 years. There was a lot. 
I mean, there was a lot more don't do this signs than there was do this signs, but I had to just keep connecting to this is the thing that feels the best to me. Mm. Um, two, I know everybody doesn't have the privilege of this, although what I'm about to say doesn't feel like a privilege at all, but I watched my brother die. He was 25 and he died. He had cancer and we were expecting him to die months later and he died in a very violent, abrupt way. And um, I tried to save his life and I couldn't. And you, you experience that and you kind of just like, you really don't have any shits left to give. <laughs> you make me cry. You don't, you don't. And then four months later, I held my grandpa's hand while he died. The artist grandpa. Oh my gosh. And then a year before my brother died, I was there as my grandma died. Had a stroke at my law school graduation and died. And you don't watch their family members die without being like, that's me someday. I could be the 25 year old, although I'm 40 now, so it couldn't be, or I could be 93. And no matter what, Jesus. whether it's 25 or 93, what do I want to say about my life? My grandpa painted a lot. He painted so much beautiful stuff. He had fun. And at five o'clock every day, he quit and went and had a cocktail with his wife that he loved since he was 18. Yeah. Right? I want to say that I loved the people I loved deeply, completely, and openly. And I want to say that I told stories. As my brother was dying, I had this out of body life experience where I saw what mattered and stories were there. It's why I have my company school for writers because it wasn't just me. It wasn't like you have to go be a New York Times bestseller. No, it was like you have to harness the power of stories to transform this world and make it a better place. So it's a privilege. Like it is a, it is a privilege to have been there and watched and held people as they died. And they are not the last. I have since lost many friends and family members to cancer in various other ways. And every time I ask myself, like, if this was me tomorrow, what would I say? Mm. And I want to be able to say I, I told some damn good stories. And that's how I live my life. And that's how I write. And that means that instead of keeping my house clean, I and like staying on a tight budget, I go and spend seven dollars on a latte at the place downstairs and write. And some of that writing will never see the world. It doesn't matter. I just have to write for me. Like my grandpa, he never sold a painting. Actually, he did. He sold one painting. He sold one painting in his life. He's probably painted thousands of paintings. He sold one. Wow. But they're the most precious things I have in my life. And it's not because, you know, I like I think I got one of them appraised and it was like I could get 20 bucks for the frame. <laughs> right? It was like for insurance. Yes. Right? Like they're not, it's not money. It's these like art is what defines our creativity is what defines our humanity. And I just, to be human, to survive being a human in everything it makes, I just, I have to keep being creative. Mm. And so that's my answer. It's just like tap into your humanity. Well, people don't usually make me cry. <laughs> so thank you uh, for sorry. that. <laughs> Not on camera either. Uh, um, yeah. I know, you're good. Well, thank you for modeling, for, and for me as a friend, because I see it, I've seen it. I've been on the other side, Yeah, you know? I feel like a couple of times, and it's, you are one of the few people I know that just will push. And, and I don't want to say that will push without breaks, because you have very strong breaks as well because you also model boundaries in a very beautiful way. And thank you for showing us how it's done. Listen, I hustle my ass off, but I also take months off as well. That's the only way I can. I hustle, you were actually the person who really helped me tap into my cycle. And like that week when I am productive, don't second guess myself. Do whatever feels good to do in that. Yeah. Like go, go, go. <laughs> and then the week before my period, well, before I had a hysterectomy, but the week before, nothing you still cycle though even if you I don't still have cycle your, yeah. i still cycle it's harder to track it's, yeah it, it's been interesting trying to track it yeah but i still cycle and you are one of the people who's helped me tap into seeing that not just in my monthly cycle but my year yeah right like you have helped me held what is fall falls when my brother died follows his birthday follows when like i've had so many deaths of fall what is it like to just like let shut it out shit nothing Nothing. And I tell you, it is hard because my book comes out. I usually take I October and November off. I was my book thinking about this. Right in the heart of it. 
And so I should be push, push, pushing that I'm taking all of December off because I can't just not. My body was starting to like have it. And For sure. it's, it's going to mean I'm losing out on a lot of money. Wow. It, it's going to mean I'm losing out on a lot of stuff. It's going to mean I'm going to be on a tight budget, but I'm going to do it because I have to. Again, it, it's one of the beauties of having a neurodiverse brain is if I don't, the consequences are too much. So I just have to. For sure. I have to. have to take care of myself. And also I think you're very much on having fun. Like you, because of you, I will say, I found, like I reclaimed my love for stickers. <gasps> Because Can we show the stickers that you gave me that you brought out. <laughs> I'm gonna have a promo right here for Passion Planner. They're a local Shout out to Passion Planner, San Diego based own San Diego based company and their stickers alone are inspiring. Yeah. And okay, tell me about your love of stickers. Sorry, you, you made stickers and I'm like, yeah, stickers. I know. It's a kind of funny story that not a lot of people know. My aunt, I grew up with my my mom was a flight attendant when I was I know that. So she was a flight attendant for a long time. I was an only child for six years. So those six years of my life, she was a flight attendant. I grew up with my grandma and in Mexico City, I mean, you know, so Mexicans like, you live with your parents until you get married type thing. And so- Sometimes even after. Yep. I mean, yes, 100%. <laughs> so two of my aunts were like left. They were the ones that were not married and my uncle. And, but they were like young professionals, like, both of them with careers and like one worked at the bolsa at the um, it was like the stock market Mex like she they had like legit real like i grew up with women with careers and so one of them everyone swore they were never gonna get married because they were like all about their career both of them got married in their late 30s if not and i think one in her 40s she moved to iceland She's been living in Iceland for 40 years now. And this is before, like, nobody knew what Iceland was. Right? That's, like, like, quite a jump. Yeah. Like, this is before Iceland was cool. And when she left, she started sending me stickers from Europe. Because, like, once you're there, it's like you just hop around and go mm -hmm. places. So she would mail me things. And amongst those things were stickers. And so I always loved stickers. And then I grew up, and I forgot about it. And so then I met you and you're like, I set goals with fucking stickers and I journal and I'm like, oh, we can do that. We have permission as adults to do that. So thank you for reminding me to be a kid again. So that started because I needed that permission too, mm. right? Like I was taking business way too seriously. I know. I was, it was, I was taking everything in life way too seriously. I and I was like, that shut up. when was the last time I felt really great? I was like, I need like a book it. I don't know if y'all did this, whoever's watching, but when I was a kid, Pizza Hut would have these book it prizes where it, every book you read, you got a sticker. And when you got to the end, you got a free pizza. It was a total scam because oh they bring the, the whole family has to come and eat Pizza Hut, right. right? Like I get my free $10 pizza and my parents spend 50 bucks with the whole family, right? right? Like it was genius. But I, I was wondering what it would look like to give myself a sticker every time I did something that put myself out there facing rejection. And that's where it started. And then I just got into stickers and I was like, well, if I put them in, they're permanent and I just used it right. and I can't ever redo it again. And you can't. And I was like, no, just like use the sticker. Yes. There's just never going to be a more perfect day than the today. sticker. And it just became a thing. And then now it's it, whenever I'm stuck, I come to stickers, especially the passion planner ones. Like, again, they have really cool artists create them. So they're really yeah. in, they're meant to be inspiring. But in general, yeah, I just no. stickers. Stickers. I've been creating stickers too. <gasps> That's exciting. Because I, I, I went back to drawing. Yeah. To like to your point of like we take business too serious. Like I was learning from people that didn't necessarily value creativity mm -hmm. in they a value money. in that way. They and value growth. money. Growth at all costs. And so I had to like step back and remind myself because I wasn't having fun. Yeah. You know, with my business, I was like, I just want to throw, like, just give me a job. If this is what it's like, I'm just going to go work at corporate and get a paycheck. Yeah. And so this, like, and I started doing inner child work, which also led me to, like, mm. explore my own, like, and so going back to the stickers, the stickers kind of, like, woke up that, like, those six-year-old that loved stickers. And I had a sticker book. I had a binder full of stickers. And the 
like when you're a kid, it's okay to just have a binder full of stickers that you just put on a piece of paper, and it's nothing other than just a cool binder full of stickers. Yes. Why can't we now? Why can't we? Let's do it. I love that. And then, yes, there's like environmental impact, but also like my sticker book is not going right. to come close to Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Especially when I support a local amazing company when I buy them, right? Totally. And I mean, we're having joy with it. I'm so it. excited about your stickers. I want some now. Thank you. I'll let you know when they're... Yeah, I made Because Fat Girl stickers too, because I was like, I have to have stickers. Yes. Mm-hmm. And ones that say read queer books. I was excited about that too, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, Lauren, tell us all the places and spaces where we can find you. So my book is available anywhere books are sold, but I highly suggest going to your local independent bookstore to grab it and getting to know your booksellers and asking them what other books yes, might interest you as they well. They love telling you. Because they're the best place to find the right book for you. And if you haven't read a book in a while that inspired you, go talk to your local independent bookstores and they will help you find one that makes you feel seen and heard. And I hope that that also includes Because That Girl. Um, I also have a nonfiction book called Body Love, 10 Steps to Profoundly Loving Your Body that's available online and um, unfortunately it's only online but now so you can't get it at your local bookstores but um, it is part coloring book and part journal and part self-help that. book and there's like a hippo in a bikini and like a giraffe staring at itself in the mirror and like a mouse in a tutu to help you feel more comfortable in your body too Yay. and so if you're looking to get into some of that play and colorful stuff that is a great way to do Good it for teens great for teens so one of my favorite things is I gave it to my my nieces when they were really little um, and they colored in it. Nice. And then as they grew up, they could start answering some of the questions about body image and how they feel about their body in it. So you can grow with it. And that's been really, it's been out for almost 10 years now and watching them grow up using it, it's so beautiful, so beautiful. How fun. Yeah, and I turn to it over and over again. It's, it's fun. And then you can find me if you want to tell your story. Like my big thing is if you read this, my goal is go write a play, go make a movie on your phone, go paint a painting, like do something creative. And if you, that includes wanting to tell your story in some way, uh, you can find me at schoolforwriters.com. I have a lot of free resources, paid programs, retreats, everything that can help you tell your story because I believe that the world needs your story now more than ever. I think Yay. stories are the way that we transform this world. I think they're the biggest advocacy we can do is telling our story honestly and truthfully as well as we can and as often as we can. Yes, I love that. We're all about that. And we'll have all the links in the show notes so everyone can just like click and go. Click and go. And find you. Get the book. The book. Go to your local bookstore. Get stickers. Get stickers <laughs> from your local bookstore. Make your own book. Um, Como se dice? These are the bookmark. bookmarks with stickers. I've done I that. I love that. That's you a know? good idea. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This is such a like dream come true. I've known you for years and I finally I get to know. Be on We've phone. talked about this. So great. Yay. Bueno, muchas gracias for stopping by. Don't forget to, and remember to share the story. Learn about all of our stories by heading over to cafecompam.com. Stay shining. Yo soy Pam Covarrubias. Nos vemos en nuestro próximo tecito o cafecito. Sabrosura, pa ti que, que.